Welcome to I Finally Get It. On this week's episode, we visit with Dr. Craig Shute of Elite DPC. Joining me in studio, as always, Dustin Webb, our producer. I'm your host, Jeff Martin. Let's get it. I mean, when it comes to business and, and obviously my business, the one thing that I finally get is that um, what we've called traditional insurance plans are not really insurance plans as far as health insurance goes. Yeah. They're really man- managed care plans. And um, and we don't need insurance for the small things, for primary care things. Um, we don't need insurance. You know, we, you don't need your homeowner's insurance to change light bulbs in your kitchen. That's right. You know, and why are we using health insurance? Why are we spending a bunch of money going back and forth with paperwork and requests to pay for small things in healthcare that we could pay cash for? And when you cut out all of that, you know, silliness in between, all of it becomes very, very, very affordable. And so uh, if I want to say one thing, one thing that I've learned in all this is that we've been told forever that if we don't have health insurance or if we don't use our health insurance, we're going to go broke and die. Uh, and the truth is, for the small things in healthcare, we really shouldn't be using health insurance at all. Yeah. So for the uh, viewers or listeners, they don't they don't probably know what a DPC is. Yeah. Explain what DPC is, and talk about elite DPC. So DPC or direct primary care, the concept is basically just a direct relationship between you and your physician and not having any middlemen in the, you know, in between the relationship. Direct primary care is a coined term. There was a bunch of physicians around the country that kind of had some ideas and came together and, and coined the term direct primary care or DPC. And at its core, it's a membership model for healthcare. A lot of the original direct primary care doctors will say that it will also include medication at cost and lab at cost and negotiated cash prices on radiology services and those kind of things. If you're a DPC doctor, typically you would say that you don't charge for visits. It's all included in the membership. Mm-hmm. We don't charge for procedures. If we charge anything for anything that we do, it's usually at cost. And so, you know, some of the more expensive things that we do in our clinic, for instance, would be like big splints and knee braces and crutches and, you know, those kind of things. And so we, we do those things at cost and we can't really include that in membership, but it ends up being pennies on the dollar. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, set of crutches in my in my office is like 17 bucks. Yeah, yeah. You Go know. get them in the ER. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't even try that. Yeah. So typical direct primary care doctors, you know, or, or traditional primary care doctors will say that all of those things are included in membership. Yep. Um, there's also concierge medicine and really direct primary care is a concierge model. It's just that sort of a specific idea of how concierge or how that, that model should work. And it it's it's intended to be affordable for everyone. Whereas Historically, when you thought about concierge medicine, it would be people that, you know, have a lot of expendable income spending a bunch of money to have a doctor on call all the time yeah. for any of their needs. And in a lot of concierge models, those doctors also charge for their visits on top of that. And what we do is charge a nominal fee and then we just don't charge for our visits. Yeah, so this is it really is an amazing concept, but it's not a concept. You you have it. You get, you're doing it. I want to go back, though. You became a doctor, uh, right? And then you served in the army. Mm -hmm. So I want you to take us from when you became a doctor, maybe some time in the army and after working in ERs, but where you thought you were going to go. And then I want to get to the point where you discovered, man, I can do this a different way. Oh, man, that's such a long story. So I joined the Navy right out of high school and uh, and the Navy saved my life. I was a knuckleheaded young kid like a lot of guys are and and not very mature. And the Navy taught me a lot of really, really great lessons and, and taught me how to succeed. And when I got out of the Navy, I was, you know, gung-ho to, to go get into undergrad and then and then on to medical school. While I was in medical school, in fact, while I was in undergrad, I was pretty sure that I wanted to be a surgeon. And, mm-hmm. and I really still like working with my hands. And, and I still sometimes miss the team teamwork aspect of what, what the OR always felt like. But I'm also a really ADD guy. Uh, and I have a tendency to like get distracted by a lot of things. And the idea of doing the same thing over and over and over again is not very appealing to my personality. Yeah. And so I recognized that in, in medical school and, you know, sort of kind of fell into family medicine accidentally. It just accidentally perfect, you know, that God kind of pushed me towards primary care and family medicine because I get to do a lot of different things. And so that was my road to, to finding family medicine, graduated from medical school, went on to uh, to serve in the army. I did my residency in the army, served as a, as a hospital doc in the army, and then as a brigade surgeon in the army, and then got out in... Um, 2014. And when I came home, uh, I had been doing some ER work and and a little bit of that and kept doing ER work, but through even in the army and then, and then um, in my ER work and then the, the primary care stuff that I was doing sort of on the side, it became very frustrating to have to deal with 
asking someone else to pay for what my patients needed or asking someone else if we could do it a certain way or trying to get someone started on a certain medication and having to beg someone to to do those things. And then all of the paperwork involved and making sure that the hospital got paid for my efforts. And it, it just, we spent, I don't know what the time, but I, I'm guessing at least 80%, uh, maybe 95% of my time was spent doing administrative things. Dealing and, with the insurance companies? Right. Well, yeah. just the third party payers or, or just yeah, the, the things administration put on us. And they were doing that because, you know, they're they're worried about the business aspect of the hospital. And that's not why I went into medicine. I went into medicine to take care of people. And so it didn't make sense that I was spending somewhere between five and 15% of my time actually seeing patients and the rest of my time doing all these administrative things yeah. so that we could get paid for our efforts. And I had heard of the the idea of concierge medicine and, you know, early on, I don't remember really exactly when I, when I was introduced to it, but then eventually heard about these guys around the country doing direct primary care or DPC. And I was very attracted to the idea, I started researching it a whole bunch. And I don't know if your listeners know, but I came to you about business advice and and, uh, and coaching. And so that's when we developed the idea of elite DPC and, and you know, every DPC, because it's not a... There's no hard, fast rule about how you do it. Yeah. We tell everybody that if you've seen one DPC, you've seen one DPC. You know, it's kind of <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like saying I have a hamburger stand. You know, like yeah, everybody right. gets the idea that you make hamburgers, but everybody does them a little bit differently. Some people offer tater tots, and some people don't. You know what I mean? That's right. Some people do onion rings, and some people don't. So we came up with our own idea of what elite DPC would look like. And we, I held fast to those kind of core concepts, membership model, including visits in it, giving people after hours access, you know, everybody, all of my patients have my cell phone number and can call me directly doing medications. at cost, labs, at cost, you know, and all those, all those things that we talked about a minute ago, we just grew it from there. But initially I had to be able to pay the bills. I'm the primary breadwinner in my family. Um, and you know, for your, you know, this, but for your listeners, I have six children at home, uh, and six, six at home. And, and oh, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, you know what I mean. It's all right. If you met my wife, you would know it's pretty obvious. We have a, we have number seven on the way. So we had six and seven years and then a nine year break. And it's a surprise. And so uh, things are good. It's funny. I tell people the story. I say, uh, I say, you know, I have I have six kids and they go, oh, and I say, uh, yeah, we had six and seven years. And they're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we had twins in the middle. And they're like, oh, like that somehow makes it easier. You know, <laughs> like, no, no, we have six and it's tough, uh, but we just do it one day at a time. And so now we're about to have number seven and, and uh, we're excited about that. But um, but the point is that I, I was, you know, I was and am the primary breadwinner in my family. And so I had to continue to work in that system for a while as we built up the practice. I went back to full-time emergency med medicine work and, and was a medical director for uh, a few years. And then as we built up the practice, then I, I, you know, backed off of my shifts and backed off my shifts and backed off and eventually gave up the medical directorship and then backed off the shifts and then went, went to, you know, six and then four and then two shifts in a month. And then when I realized I was at a point where I, I could, you know, support my family on just what we were doing with, with elite DPC, oh. I gave up all of that and, and walked away from corporate medicine altogether. And, and I've never looked back. It's been freedom in healthcare. It's been freedom for me. It's been freedom for my patients. It's been freedom for the companies that, that sign on with me for their benefits and, and use us for the primary care portion of what they offer for their employees, whether that's a company of three people or a company of uh, right now, the biggest is maybe 30 employees, but we've, t I've been a portion of the physician groups that have taken care of really, really big companies as yeah. well. So it's amazing kind of looking back just because uh, we were a part of that mm -hmm. together and it was so fun. And I just remember thinking, this is just a new vehicle. This is a new way to do Old medicine. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Well, if, we developed the tagline. It's old medicine with modern technology. That's exactly it's, right. It's just like old time medicine where you had, you know, you knew your doctor, you had access to your doctor. You could, you knew where they lived. You know, a lot of That's times right. you go knock on their door and ask them for things at their house and on the weekends and things. That's right. Um, the difference is it's all done by cell phone now. And so we can do FaceTime calls and we can do, you know, texting back and forth and, and, and those kind of things. Uh, you know, in the early days, I remember going on a trip to, I think I was in Arkansas and I started having an issue and how nice was it that I could text my physician and friend, yeah. but text my physician and, and say, look, I'm having this problem and then hear back within seconds 
you yeah. know, it's okay. Yeah. And you've seen the map that we keep in the clinic. So we have yeah, a map yeah, in the exactly. clinic with all the little pins in it. And, and the record is South Korea now, but, um, South Korea, yeah, tell, yeah. tell me your favorite story though. And you don't have to names or obviously um, conditions. The, the two stories that really stick out are my two favorites. One was I was in Costa Rica and a patient was in, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. They weren't in Cancun. I can't remember where they were. They were at a, at a resort or something. And the wife, in, of that couple got sick and they went into town to a pharmacy. And in Mexico, you don't need a doctor's note or, or, phys, or a prescription or anything. You just go pick up what you want. But what do you pick up, right? And so yeah, they, exactly. they called me and I answered my phone poolside in Costa Rica <laughs> and walked them through the pharmacy telling them, you know, what to pick up for the symptoms that she had. And then, of course, they go back after their vacation and I go back after my vacation and I got to see them face to face in the that's clinic you know, three days later or whatever, but all part of the membership. And, I'm, and we're happy to do that. That's right. So that's one of my fun stories because I was on the beach in Costa Rica and they were on the beach in Cancun and, yeah. or whatever, somewhere in the Yucatan. And we were able to, to, to connect. And then another one of my favorite stories is a family who on their 20th wedding anniversary committed to going through a wine tasting tour on their 30th wedding anniversary through Northern Italy. And so they saved for 10 years, save, save, save for 10 years. And on the 30th wedding anniversary, they go to Northern Italy, go to Florence, Italy for a 10 day wine tasting tour. The husband uh, has this issue with chronic sinusitis and nasal polyps and things. And they land in Florence and he calls me freaking out. You know, first of all, he called me from Florence, Italy, right? Calls his doctor on his cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. And says, uh, I'm completely socked in. I can't smell anything. I can't taste anything. And on I'm a wine tasting that tour. That I saved for 10 years <laughs> to be able to go on, right? Oh, man. And so um, I was like, I've never dealt with anything in Italy, but go find a pharmacy and see if they're if they're willing to fill a prescription from me. Sure enough, there was a pharmacy on the ground floor uh, street level of their hotel. And so they go to the pharmacist and they say, hey, listen, is there any way our doctor can write a prescription that you'll fill? And the pharmacist said, sure, if he faxes over his credentials, I'll be more than happy to fill out, fill whatever prescription he, he sends. Mm -hmm. And so I faxed over a copy of my license and faxed over a prescription. And 20 minutes later, the wife was like calling me. I can't believe we just did that. That's incredible. <laughs> the next morning, she called me crying. She's like, he's completely cleared up. Thank you so much. This is amazing. And so then, the, you know, yeah. they hugged me and brought me a bottle of wine when they, <laughs> yeah. when they came back from Italy, which was pretty cool. So membership has its privilege. That's right. <laughs> that is outstanding. Yeah. So those are two of my favorite stories. But we have hundreds like that. I just, those are the ones that stick out. We talked about a new way of doing things. And, and, and in most businesses, you don't have to stick to the old way of doing it. Mm -hmm. What is it? Old medicine, new technology. What did we come up with? I can't remember. Yeah. Old time medicine. Old time medicine. New technology. new technology. I want to talk about you though. What, tell me about life before DPC mm -hmm. and life since you, you launched. Family, you know. I was born a nine pound <laughs> boy. <laughs> Look, I know you were working like crazy, mm -hmm. doing a lot of ER shifts. Mm -hmm. You had you had an awareness of direct primary cares, mm -hmm. but you you bit the bullet. You, you took off and you did it. Mm -hmm. You launched and it had to be a little bit scary. And then I'm sure you're glad you you did it now. Oh, and, and no, I couldn't go. I can't go back. I'm, yeah, I'm, I couldn't go back. I so imagine how hard was it making that shift when you said, you know what, I, I can't do medicine like this anymore. It's not the best for the patient. It was unnerving um, because, you know, at the time I was employed by our local hospital system and, and I was I still am close friends with the CEO of that system. You know, when I start, when I signed on with them, I told them that I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be a successful physician in their system and, and I wanted to eventually be, you know, involved in leadership in the hospital and those kind of things. And, and so when I kind of made up my mind that I needed to do something different, uh, I went to him and said, Hey, you know, what do you think about me doing this? And he wasn't very happy with me at the time. Of course, we talked through it all and, and they understood like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to eliminate myself from the system. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to not have access to, you know, bringing my patients for, or sending my patients in for, for specialty care and those, those kind of things. I just wanted to step away from employment with the hospital system and do my own thing because I felt like it was the right way to do it. And so yeah. we, we talked through it all. And, and ultimately the hospital through their legal department, let me out of my non-compete and gave me their blessing. And, and so, so, um, I went on, but maybe that wasn't the initial hurdle. The initial hurdle was talking to my wife about it and letting her know what, what I thought about. And, and, 
to her credit, you know, she just said, look, I trust you. If you think that this is something that you can do or should do, then, then you should do it. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and so, you know, she and I, obviously our priorities are making sure that our kids are taken care of. And so, and we're a team in that aspect. It wasn't like I just made a decision and she just needed to suck it up. <laughs> you know, I went to her and said, Hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And this is what it's going to look like for a while. And I knew that I was going to have to work really long hours, you know, kind of running a business, starting a new clinic and having to work full time yeah. ER work to try to do it. And, and to her credit, man, she just said, look, I trust you. And and if you think that this is the best way for us to, the best direction for us to take, then then let's do it. And yeah. so that was the first hurdle. And the second hurdle was then going to the hospital system yeah. and, and talking with them. But, you know, a lot of doctors in primary care or in direct primary care talk about burning their bridges and like, you know, they're they're kind of angry with the system. And and, and I, I don't see it like a an adversarial relationship. I just understand that the insurance companies are businesses and they have to run their businesses so that they're profitable. They're, they're, they are beholden to their shareholders and, and they're doing the things that they see best for that. And, and the hospitals are trying to make sure that they're at least the private hospitals, they're not beholden to shareholders, but they're beholden to the communities, which for sure. that they, that they support. And so, you know, they're, they're just doing business to try to make sure that they don't go under either. And so everybody's kind of working together to do that. And Lafayette's a small town, you know what I mean? Like we, we pretend like we're we in a big city here, yeah, but, yeah, you we know, do. 90,000 people or whatever. It's mm-hmm. not, we're not that big a, t- a city for sure. We're not that big a town, much less a city. And so I didn't want to burn a bunch of bridges here. You know, I wanted to live in our community and be, you know, seen as an asset to the community. And so I just wanted to do it the right way. And then after that, it was just a matter of like sucking it up and knowing, Hey, you're going to be working a hundred, 120 hours a week for a little while until this, you know, gets off the ground. And I did, I, you know, yeah, worked, yeah. worked my tail off for a while, a lot of sleepless nights and, and a lot of sleepless days trying to keep the clinic going when I'd been working all night in the ER. There's a line we've used in, in some of our presentations. I tell people I'm a doctor, uh, but I'm also a husband and I'm a daddy and, uh, and sometimes I'm a patient too. And when I was in the system before I spent a lot of nights, uh, I'm not going to cry, Jeff. I'm, I'm, I'm about to, I need to call, I need to like take, must take a breath, but <clears throat> I spent a lot of nights um, missing out on soccer games and missing out on baseball yeah. games and and not having dinner with my family and and that kind of stuff. Even when I wasn't doing full time side work, uh, just because I was constantly having to deal with all the administrative tasks that are put on us by the third party payers in, in traditional healthcare today. You know, I worked a lot of uh, Christmases and, and Thanksgivings and Easter's and I missed a lot of birthdays and you know that kind of stuff before and today. I don't miss those things, man. Yeah, I, I eat yeah. lunch with my wife every day. Oh, that's um, huge. I, you know, I um, I don't miss any baseball games. If I miss a baseball game, it's because I was at a soccer game for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, but I'm not missing it because I have to work or anything like that. That's right. Know? And even when my patients call me with urgent needs, if it's appropriate for my clinic, it can wait an hour, you know? And so I defy you to call your doctor and, and get seen within an hour on any day, much less correct, a Saturday correct. afternoon or whatever. But it's very, very rare that I get pulled away from any of those things because of really big urgent needs in the clinic. It happens every now and then, but sure. but it's pretty rare. And I'm happy to make myself available because, you know, I remember when I was a kid, when I was super sick and my parents could, you know, just call up our pediatrician or go over to the pedi- pediatrician's house. Cause I, w- I lived in a little bitty town in, in Louisiana. Yeah. And so I want people to have that, that sort of access. And, and I want people to know that they're, they're taken care of and then they can, they can, um, respond. But, but the point is that it's very, very rare for me to be pulled away from any kind of family things now. And so I don't miss out on that stuff anymore for all of the, you know, what used to be, which was long hours and missing out on a lot of things and whatever. I mean, like I'm a physician. I'm not, it's not like I, my life was horrible. You know what I mean? I could, I could be in worse situ- situations, but I worked really, really hard to be able to do what we do. And then on the back end of it to find out, Oh, by the way, and you're going to miss out on all your family things and you're yeah. going to, you know, um, it was a little disheartening, but I don't have to worry about those things anymore. So yeah. it's pretty cool. I love it, man. Yeah. You, you're, uh, you're definitely where you're supposed to be. I agree. For all the business owners who are, um, kind of stuck in a, a certain, either job or that, but they want to come on and do something. What would you tell them? Because your, your, your big thing to me is the leap, the risk that you took mm-hmm. and something that has never been done really in Lafayette, the way you did mm-hmm. it. Talk to those folks. Today, almost every business I, owner I talk to, their second or third line item in their PL is healthcare. For those that, that provide products, typically number one is products, the cost of products, pro- cost of goods. Number two is typically payroll. 
And number three is healthcare. And for people that provide services, it's payroll and then healthcare. Exactly. And so either number two or number three is typically healthcare on their PL. And when we start looking at those numbers and realizing like a lot of that money is because it's it's, you know, you're asking it's the equivalent of asking the homeowner's insurance company to come and change your light bulb in your kitchen. You know, it's just th- that stuff drives up prices. And so when we show people how they can get away from that and all of a sudden they start saving tons of money and realizing like, oh, my gosh, like I, I, I thought that I had to do it this other way. And now my people are taken care of and we're saving a ton of money. And then on top of that, all the people have way better access and, th- you know, Correct. they have benefits. Because today, if you have a if you have a traditional plan, you may be offering that as a benefit. Like, you know, as far as on the books, it looks like, hey, my my employees have these benefits. But if they have a high deductible plan, they may not be able to afford to even use that plan. You know, it may be that all their extra expendable cash is going to the other hat, their portion of what they're paying for their health care exactly plan. Right. And so when they have to use it, then they don't have the money to pay into the deductible and they end up with all these extra bills and and things. And so um, not only does the business owner save money, but the employees are, are happier. And in fact, I was just talking to a, a business. We have a business here in town that has about 28 employees. And he was just telling me that we're currently saving him 15,000 a month. So just a little bitty company with 28 yeah, employees. That's right. We're that's saving huge. him 15,000 a month over what he was paying for healthcare two years ago before he signed on. With Holy us. cow. And he was saying he's heard about all the increases for this year and how like he doesn't even want to think about how much it could be. But he was thanking me for, you know, badgering him basically until he finally uh, gave us a shot. It's a mistake to think that if you don't have a traditional health insurance plan that you're going to go broke and die. It's a mistake to think that that's somehow the best way to do things because it's, I mean, we know you and I know now by by experience, it's not. Um, And whether you're an individual who is self-employed or, you know, some sort of 1099 wage earner, you know, realtors and hairdressers and I don't know, people that have like construction jobs and they kind of do subcontracting by themselves. You know, I met a plumber the other day who just does his own thing by himself. He doesn't even have employees. Or you're a company with 10, 12 or 1200 employees, you know, we can show you a better way to do things. And hey, the conversation's free. So, you know, worst case scenario is we have a conversation and I'm wrong. But in most cases for business owners, if they look into direct primary care and some of the options that can go along with that, uh, they'll probably be giving them their, their employees way better benefits for yeah. a fraction of the cost. Correct. Correct. No doubt about it. All your patients, all the people in your community you you reach out to or you come in contact with, mm-hmm. how do you hope to leave people different and better just because they met Dr. Craig Shute? I pray every day that, I, that I'm that i a positive influence on the world around me and the people that I'm fortunate enough to come in contact with. That's a real prayer that I, that I actually do say is part of my kind of daily ritual, talking to God and asking for, you know, guidance in my life. And I fail at it every day. <laughs> but but if I'm attempting to to leave someone with something, it's just to leave them with a positive mindset on on their day or their, you know, whatever's going on in their lives. And uh, I fail at it every day, but I try that if I was going to do one thing, it's just to, to give people a positive mindset about where they are in life, a positive mindset about where they're going in life, positive mindset about their efforts and the current, you know, the current challenges they face. Um, so yeah, if it was one thing, it'd be that. Thanks for joining us this week on I Finally Get It. For more information on Dr. Craig Shoot and what he's got going on, visit our show notes at ifinallygetit.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you're a business owner and you have a light bulb moment you think would help other business owners, please visit me at jeff at ifinallygetit.com.